When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. It is so good to be here, I just have to say, for my family and I. Hi, Noel. It's good to see you, too. Love to you. <laughs> we, um, 11 years ago, made our journey up to the Northwest and spent uh, four beautiful years here, and that this is my very last Sabbath in the Northwest for this stage of our life. It's such a full circle moment, so I especially want to thank Pastor McClarty uh, for uh, welcoming us for such a special moment, especially for Gwilian, and then to also offer his pulpit this day that uh, we may worship God together. So I am so excited to be here. We are headed to Texas. <laughs> I grew up on the East Coast, first half of my life. My adult life has been entirely on the West Coast. So when I got a lovely little phone call asking if I'd like to be on a list for the Keene Church in Texas, I wondered, Lord, who do I know in Texas? Who do I know in Texas? Well, we've been there for two trips now. The first trip was the interview trip where they had me preach. And the second trip we just got back from, and that was to House Hunt. And we couldn't walk five steps without knowing someone. Because the Adventist family is worldwide. And everybody's related to you and I somehow by two or three steps. And so there are some beautiful people in Texas. While we were there the first time, we got off the plane. And the very next day, they took us on a tour of the campus. We were in a very adorable golf cart, because it's hot, you don't want to walk around without shade and mobility, little wind, that's the only wind you're gonna get, right, on your golf cart. And on the front of the golf cart were long horns <laughs> with pretty tips right at the front. So we are in Texas, we are in Texas. My first sermon there, I uh, was wanting to connect with this new congregation and I remembered a sermon that Randy Roberts had preached when he first arrived in California. And he told a Texas joke that I never forgot. And I thought to myself in angst prior to this sermon, do you tell Texans a Texas joke? They know their own jokes. So I was really a little nervous about that, but I figured, okay, if they know their own joke, I'll let them finish it for me, right? Just finish it right in the moment. But they didn't seem to know it, which I was praising God for. And that is this joke. Don't ask a man if he's from Texas. If he's from Texas, he will tell you. If he's not from Texas, you don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> Amen. I noticed on the tour just the day before that no one said, Pastor, are you from Texas? They're too polite to have embarrassed me that day. But I was able to let them know that my family and Bob himself was born in Texas, and that somewhere deep in this heart must be a really special affinity for that place. And they liked that. I will work that. <laughs> I will work that. I will need to work that because I grew up on the East Coast, and those of you who get into football, Every Thanksgiving, who plays against whom? Yeah, Dallas Cowboys and the Redskins. I grew up in Maryland on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this because I'm either going to get fired or lose my family over the football thing. So 
We have a lot to figure out as we move to Texas, but I can tell you this. As was mentioning during the baptism, divine appointments are so special. There's so much fun involved in seeing a new place and trying on new routines, but God is so good. And as we visited this place, we met wonderful people. And I tell you, as big as Texas is, what's really special about Texas is its people. And we are very called, we feel very called to this assignment, and uh, we are very excited to go. Do you like a good mystery? Have you finished your summer mystery novel? You picked up that great, interesting book that'll keep you riveted, a page turner, all summer long. Are you almost finished here in August with that page turner mystery? And if those aren't your favorite kinds of forms, uh, mystery novels, we all like a good mystery. It's just a different genre, right? Maybe a good movie. I think we like mysteries so much because your very life story is the most exciting mystery of all. The twists, the turns, the conflicts, the challenges, the victories, the blessings, and the hope. And the hope. The hope is what gets you up tomorrow, out of bed, to try on a new day, to see how that mystery will turn. We like a good mystery. We know it also because as we invest in the life of another child, our children, wow, we are riveted upon that mystery, aren't we? We are sitting at the edge of our seats, anywhere they go, anything they do. Whatever they do up front, we have a child care in Shelton that we open, 256 children, four years in. When we have a Christmas program and invite the children to do anything up front at any age, the mystery of what they will say <laughs> brings us in standing room only. There is nothing more precious than the mystery of life. And your story is a precious mystery. Paul knew about this mystery. And in Colossians 1.27, he speaks of this incredible mystery that he is now committed to with all his life and day and breath. He has dropped everything else that is special in life to focus on this one mystery. Patton Dodd wrote an article in Success Magazine, an online magazine, dated May 7 of 2012. And he writes in his three-page article these things. He says, I attended a gathering last fall, a gathering of entrepreneurs, artists, intellectuals, scholars, and other movers and shakers from the United States and Canada. The gathering was private, if not top secret. And I am not at liberty to say who was hosting it or who was even there. The attendee list was intriguing in its diversity. And those there, fashion models, politicians, Oscar nominee filmmakers, quantum physicists. How fun. I love hearing about these gatherings. Of all those who are movers and shakers in this world meeting in one space, what are they going to come up with? The mystery of what the outcome will be when those gather together and plan. Patton Dodd goes on to say, what held this group together during this time of meeting were two things. Number one, nearly everyone in attendance had achieved some measure of success and often staggering success. The second point, he takes a few sentences to describe. Outsiders looking in would not have seen the gathering as religious in nature. I didn't see a Bible all weekend or hear much prayer, but if they listened to enough conversations, they would have realized that everyone seemed to have arrived with a certain warning in mind. 
one delivered by a certain special prophet some 2,000 years ago, this warning, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose their own soul? The movers and shakers one year ago gathered, and that was the heart and soul and purpose of their gathering. The danger of soul forfeiture. Music, films, clothing lines, businesses, ads, schools, and gobs of money. Most of them weren't done making all their stuff, but they were far enough along to realize that unless their stuff served them some greater purpose, it was just, well, stuff. He goes on to say, I'd never experienced anything quite like it, a collection of people with enviable careers and incomes who got together to talk about how to avoid achieving everything you want in life only to realize that you have nothing you really need. Success without soul. That was their primary fear and the reason they were dreaming up powerful and wonderful ideas for renewing the world and engaging their gifts and talents. Success without soul is a common condition. A common condition. I think about the gathering we are in today and the regular routine of it each week. I can't think of a better way to define church. You, movers and shakers, gifts and talents, having gathered each week to take a small break in the busyness of pursuing excellence and growth and life abundant for which Christ said, I came to give you. Pursue life abundant. And yet, once in a while, stop and gather and pause in these very elite gatherings and ask, how can we achieve success without losing our very own soul? Paul was one of the elites of his day. He had made it. He had climbed the ladder, and he was the promised one yet to step up in. He was being mentored into all that he had known. He was educated. He was gifted. But he dropped everything and his world was turned upside down. If you would open up your Bibles, I've got a few texts for you here today. If you would open up your Bibles to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. He had studied the word of God, but now he feels as if this mystery of life has been filled within his heart, and he will do nothing else but preach this word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, that mystery of life, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known this special mystery among the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, the abundance of this mystery revealed, which is, and here's the answer, according to Paul, here is the answer to this mystery of life and this dilemma we find ourselves in, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of glory. We were at camp meeting this year. Many of you know Pastor Jesse. He uh, did a lot of improv work and was connected with that team by friendship uh, years ago. He was so hilarious in our minds as he had an, a camp meeting revelation. A camp meeting revelation. His assignment for a long time was to work with the youth and young adults in their tent. And the youth and young adults um, it's a special time of life where we are coming to understand this mystery of life we've been given and step up into it. And he said, the dilemma is so many find themselves in a very difficult situation 
where we are holding on to things that bring no hope. And letting go of those things, a bad relationship, maybe addiction of one sort or another, was a common conversation that he was having in that youth tent. But here was his revelation. As he came by, as a group of us were standing on a Sabbath afternoon there at Camp Mini, he walked by and he said, here's my revelation. I now have a baby of my own. And now I am no longer in the youth tent. I am now in the beginner tent. And here's my revelation. The issues are not that much different. Try pulling that star out of a two-year-old's hand. The letting go process is painful. They have a grip. And we thought that was very comical. My daughter had worked in the beginner's tent this year, and she said, Mommy, I figured out how to let them, help them let go of the star. Because it was a heaven theme this year, and you know how the program goes, and those of you who are Sabbath school teachers or, or educators in the classroom, you have a lot of hands-on things that they can touch and feel, and that's good. And uh, so the heaven theme, there was a star, and she said, but there's a basket, you see. And you, you give them the star, and when that time is done, don't pull it out of their hand because they'll cry, and they will be mad at you in the heaven cradle roll time. And you don't want mad children in heaven. <laughs> So you pull out your angel, and you show them the angel. And that star has no value at all, down to the ground. And now the only thing we can think about is the angel. So everybody wants the angel, now everybody has the angel. But the program goes on. So now, don't try to pull the angel out of their hand, because you'll have a very sad baby. So instead, you pull out the crown, and you hold that in front, and the angel has no value. And we're off. In this incredible cycle that starts young, that I like to call dissatisfied contentment. And in this dissatisfied, contented cycle we find ourselves in as human beings is the source and the center of that question that gathers these, these wonderful individuals in questions on how to not live that kind of dissatisfied, contented life cycle and lose out on your own soul. Christmas is like this, too. We buy all the gifts, we give them out, we forget them, and we're ready for Christmas next year. And uh, those of us living in this generation have seen the entire technology boom of dissatisfied contentment happen. And it's not stars and angels and crowns. Instead, it's iPhone 1, and what is that anymore? <sighs> iPhone 2, right? dissatisfied contentment. How do you find joy? How do you find soul living a cycle of dissatisfied contentment? By the way, it was kind of cute in this beginner's class that they couldn't, after day one, the story is, at the very end of the program, they had little trumpets that would sound uh, at the very end for heaven, and they made real sounds, but there was no next thing to give them. So at the end of blowing all their trumpets, all these little beginners thrilled with this grand finale little token, they all cried when you tried to pull the, the trumpets away from them. And uh, so they said, let's not do the trumpets for the rest of the week. Too hard to let go of the final trumpet, the final trumpet in our dissatisfied contentment. But Paul somehow knew the answer. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This Jesus that walked the earth was handing out hope like candy to everyone that passed by. He loved everyone. He could see through the smoke uh, filters of that dissatisfied, contented cycle that each one was clinging onto, holding onto, and rather than pull it out of their hands, he offered them a new hope. Christ in you the hope of glory. What do we hope for today? It shows up. It shows up in how we live and what we choose and what we sacrifice for. There's a book um, I'm reading right now called God's at War by Kyle Eidelman. He has the fourth largest church in the U.S. and he has quoted uh, Mr. Guinness in this way. Idolatry is huge in the Bible dominant in our personal lives, and irrelevant in our mistaken estimations. 
in this modern day, those things we hope for, those things we sacrifice for, those things we attach ourselves to and won't let go of that do not bring soul and life and joy, often are because we have irrelevant, mistaken estimations of how powerful they are in our everyday life. If you would open up your Bibles now, because Paul goes on in conversations to more fully fully explain this truth in its fullness in 2 Corinthians. He's having a second conversation with the saints of Corinth. And in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, he says to them in verse 19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by me and Silas and Timothy, we all came and we preached the word of God in its fullness to you. And that message was not yes and no. Do you ever feel like the conversation of religion is mostly no, 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 no. Maybe a little bit of yes, yes and no, but a whole lot of no. He said, that wasn't what we preached. That wasn't the secret of the mystery that allows one to live life abundantly and not lose out on their soul. No, we preached a message that has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, how many promises has God made? They're beautiful promises. And each and every one of them, it says, in Christ is yes. Each one of them is yes. What are you hoping for? When we receive Christ, this, this Christ that changed Paul's life into our everyday pursuit of life abundant, we find that the things we chase after are different. He says what we hope for is different. We no longer hope for those other things that bring nothing. Instead, we are filled with the yes. So imagine it's Christmas time. Christmas in August, right here, Green Lake Church. We have gathered special elite meeting, we have gathered together, and Christ says, whatever you're longing for, I'm not going to pull that other thing out of your hand here today, lest I make you all cry in church. Instead, I'm going to offer you something new and different. Are you looking for forgiveness? Yes. It's yours done. Are you looking for love? Yes. Are you hoping for success? Yes. Have I gifted you with all gifts and talents and abundance? Yes, yes, yes. And when Paul speaks of this message, he doesn't just say Christ in you, hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you think of that phrase, hope of glory, do you think, what do you think of? Heavenly, eternal things? That's a good picture attached to that phrase. Eternal life, second coming. A more, more uh, common everyday attachment to that phrase might be the Olympics. Hope of glory. I'm going to win the gold. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to run the race and I'm going to be successful. Hope of glory. But Paul says, let me tell you a message that is full of real hope. Hope that will fill your heart and leave you contented. Hope for glory, true glory. And let me describe glory. The Bible uses the word glory in two ways. The first one, favor. The hope of favor. The answer to Christ when Christ in you is you are favored. You are special and you are favored. That's a beautiful feeling. That, do you feel more contented? with the thought of being fully favored by God. The second use of the word glory is his presence. God is with you. You are in his presence, and you are met with favor. The hope of glory and every promise that comes out of that relationship is yes, 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 yes. I am yours, you are mine, yes. And with Christ in us, as Paul sees it, he dropped everything. He gave up the successful path he had been on at the cost of his own community's favor. And he chased down this other thing. 
and God blessed him. And he went on to say in that same verse, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. And it goes on to say, and so through him, the amen, the amen. Amen means I agree. Amen means yes. At the end of a good message, yes. At the end of a proposal, yes. I receive all the yeses, Jesus' hope of glory. I remember a moment, it was while we were here at Green Lake. And you know how busy life gets, yes? And when you have children, you are tending to them. You need to make sure they're fed, they're clean, and then you have to do that again. Fed and clean, fed and clean. Hug, hug, fed and clean. Walk. It's a lot of work, right? And then on top of it, you're working and you're doing all these other things. I remember a clear moment, and Caden doesn't even remember it, but he was just a little, little one. And while I was gathering up some food for him, he looked at me and said, I want you. I want you. Don't need the food yet. That would come in another few minutes. But for now, I want you. Jesus, God the Father, Christ in us, the hope of glory, I want you. I'm sure that at the end of that great weekend conversation, down deep, everyone knows it's that personal relationship that makes all the difference. At the end of your day, that's what makes all the difference. And you will drop anything and everything you've ever pursued in life, that you will have the people you love in life, one-on-one, -on -one, you and me. I want you. And what's so precious in 2 Corinthians, and I think this is the reason we have a 2 Corinthians. I wish the Romans had did, done this so that we can have a 2 Romans. But this incredible epiphany that Paul shares with them, all promises are yes in Christ, that's a deep subject, is found in chapter 1 in a very funny conversation. The Corinthians are mad at him. They're worried because they heard and he said he was coming back to visit them. They had such a great time with him the first time. They said, are you sure? We heard you're not coming back this way. And his answer was, in Jesus, all is yes. They were saying, I want you and I want this God of yours that you're talking so powerfully about. I want you. Do you feel the contentment filling up? when those basic needs are met, Christmas. And somehow Jesus, for Paul and for the Corinthians and for you and I today, flips those two words of a dilemma upside down as he does everything. And instead of dissatisfied contentment, we now live a contented dissatisfaction. We start fully contented with love and forgiveness and joy and happiness and fulfillment and life abundant. And then we look around at our world and we say, oh, I wish everybody could enjoy that. I see my friend chasing this other little cycle and holding on to things that don't help and falling into this, this deep hole. So the dissatisfaction is less for your own soul and more for everyone else. I want you. I want you to enjoy what I know. And Paul could do nothing else. He was so fully contented, but so fully dissatisfied that the whole world would know the answer to the mystery of life and live it with great abundance. Amen. In the rest of this article, it speaks of a Mr. Justin Mayo. Justin Mayo is the founder of Red Eye Inc. Justin Mayo is of the Mayo Clinic fame. And he has a family with more money than he knows himself what to do with. And he knows the feeling of having everything life has to offer and wondering what's worth living for. And so he, in his journey of making sure that success didn't end a life in his heart without soul, he started Red Eye Inc. and he connects up, makes friends with anybody and everybody that are in his same predicament. And he helps them find the I want you and the dissatisfaction for others to serve them, invest their money and make a difference in this world. 
and that same nonprofit that connects cultural creatives with opportunities to serve others, now, which started in Hollywood, has chapters in New York City, London, Paris, and Sydney. I may have told you the story of someone who remains very special to me, and any chance I get, I tell her story. Her name is also Mayo, but not of the Mayo Clinic fame. Her name is Nancy Mayo, and I knew her back in the California days when we had a small inner city big brother, big sister program working with kids at her high school in San Bernardino, California. Kids who were still wondering how to find soul, but how to do it when there was no success in the world to be found. And a little bunch of us from various parts of the Loma Linda campus, we had uh, students, brand new students on campus eager to serve, deciding to help. We had staff and faculty and the president willing to help. And we aligned ourselves one-on-one -on -one with her students at San Bernardino High School. And after several years of doing great work together, she uh, began to lose weight. And we thought nothing much of it. She was still going to work. She was still energetic, it seemed. But we didn't know that at night, at the end of her day, she would collapse on her couch and had gotten doctor's reports that she was battling cancer. But she decided, I am going to live life abundantly, and I am going to go to work every day, and I am going to keep serving these students who I love so much that they might have hope. And one day I got the phone call as she lay on her bed where she would take her final last breaths. Do you wonder what you'll say in your very last breaths? I was moved by Nancy Mayo's final words. The call came, Pastor Jennifer, she doesn't have a church affiliation and she's, I think she's just hanging on so she can talk to you. So I went to her house and sat by her side. A woman we have done so much together, just loved her so. And her friends said they had talked about, reflected on their days and all the silly things they had done and all the mistakes they had made. But they didn't care about that anymore. And she looked at me, and in between breaths, she tried to get out this sentence, Pastor, would you do my service? And when you do, would you pray for me as if I am one of you? She had never attended church. She never had a Bible study. But she, she wanted the God that each one of those volunteers knew. She wanted in her final days to have been associated with the Christian that would be known by their love. I want you. And we prayed for her, and she was more than one of us. She was his. She is his. We are his. We have every opportunity to live life abundant. And we are invited this day to live big for him. The article ends this way. Keep saying yes. And he didn't even quote my second Corinthians passage. I say amen. Keep saying amen. Keep saying yes to that nudge that is inside of you. And as we gather to church, let us live big for him. You know what's so cool? In verse 12, several sentences after this great revelation, he says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Amen? That's an exciting life to live. That's a page turner of a life. So fully contented in him. So dissatisfied for the world. I am going to now live bold for him. My last passage is in, in uh, 1 Peter. If you would open your Bibles. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And let's just listen to these words of God preached in fullness. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth at our baptism, at our commitment, 
at our yes to the great proposal of life abundant and contented living. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. Through you, though you, I'm sorry, though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. And here's the last part of the passage. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. May we live life abundant. May we be successful. May we be excellent at everything we do. May we pursue all that God has to offer. But may we, church, not forfeit our souls in the process. May we be people who live through his power and grace, Christ in us, the hope of glory.